in many slings and arrows for this event. And, you know, we all know it's hard enough to travel, you know, this mortal coil on our own being a little different, you know. Um, our entire existence has been one where she empowers that difference and she's there for people. So I'd like to give a round of hand for, for her. This is, this is, she could have very well been in a very bad spot because of all of this. And, and you know, it, it's not very often in life that we come across somebody, you know, that has a heart big enough to accept us unconditionally. And she is one of those people. So we're very blessed to have her in the organization and have her with, with us on this. So, anyway, that's, I just wanted to thank you for that. Thanks, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. For everybody who doesn't know, I'm Christopher Gower, um, one of the founding elders of Iron Bone and Stone. Um, we have Yvette um, and Dan, they're also elders. Um, we'd also like to welcome, uh, this is Matt, uh, Matt Flavel. He is the, pronounce it, I'll tell you good. that word, of, of the AFA. And he has come here to support this gathering and to support Brian and his talk. Um, so, guys. Once again, thank you guys so much. I'm not going to talk anymore. Uh, maybe I am. Um, but uh, so what we're going to do today is Brian's going to do, he's going to give a talk on, um, on Aegis Feast. Um, then we're going to probably take a little bit of a break. Then we're going to do a gloat together. Um, and then we're just going to be together, you know, for a little while. Uh, he's going to do some book signings, that kind of thing, for those that want your book signed. Um, and just while we're talking about what what's going on, uh, Dan also I don't know if you guys have been over to his little area over there, but he's an amazing artist. He's a he's a licensed rat fink artist. He does bone carving, he does horn carving, uh, painting, all that kind of stuff. So definitely have a conversation with him because you do commission pieces, correct? Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I think I'm done. That was my cue. So Brian, thank you, brother. Appreciate you so much. I'll turn it over to Brian. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Everybody's patience and consideration with all the things we had to go through to get even to this point. It's been quite a struggle, and I want all of you to be very aware of the efforts that these two fine people had to go through, the slings and arrows they had to endure to even get a group of us people to be together to talk about our faith, to raise a horn, to enjoy um, the conviviality and friendship that goes with Austin Truth. Give a hand to Angela and Chris. Eager's um, Feast is a book that I, 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 uh, I wrote it kind of after the fact when I finished up a book called Nobility. I was asked to give a presentation at uh, the AFA Midsummer in the Hall in Northern California. And they said, what, how about talking about Lagoos? I said, okay, well that's kind of different. <laughs> Lagoos is uh, one of those real interesting rooms. Not many people talk about it. You don't see people working with Lagoos like they do with Fehu for wealth or Urus for, for strength, for Othala, for the homeland. It doesn't lend itself to these very powerful images that you get when you talk about some of these other very powerful symbols of, of heathenry. Lagoos is an interesting thing. It represents water. And if you think about it, it... it all the different variations of Lagoos and all of the runic alphabets have some aspect of water involved, the waterfall. It also has something to do with the leak. And I'm not going to go into that today, but I think I want you all to pay very close attention to the idea that in the runic alphabet there are three different runes that represent some state of water. You have Isa, which is ice, you have Lagoos, which is water, and you have Hagalos, which is hail. There's something very important to remember with all that. And as I was thinking about this to give this presentation for Midsummer, it be, it, when I wrote Eager's Feast and the two kind of worked together, I began to think, you know, this entire setup of Eager's Feast occurs in the realm of the ocean giant. It is entirely surrounded by the energies of Lagoos. So this speech is going to be something along the lines, or this conversation, if you will, <laughs> is going to be along the lines of trying to explain that. You see, our earth is covered with water, right? And there are oceans of it in the sky. Well, not today, it's cloudless. Uh, if you put it under pressure, you can move enormous amounts of, uh, 
uh, material with very little effort, hydraulics. If you focus it under pressure, it will cut steel as surely as any laser. Um, if you heat it up and create steam, you can create power that will power entire cities, states, and countries. So when you begin to think about water in that context, now all of a sudden it's got a whole new, whole new meaning. Look at all these really different things you can do with water. Everything that walks, talks, breathes, crawls, thinks is composed of this mysterious element called water. Everything. You look at that tree, you look at this grass, you look at the earth, you look at us, and you look at our minds, and they're composed largely of water. And when you think of mind, I'm not talking about necessarily the brain so much, as I am as that powerful combination of the heart and the brain to focus on an idea that will help you become something more, that will help you achieve a goal that you think you really want. <laughs> we'll get into that here in just a little bit. PowerPoint. We had all this set up. We had PowerPoint and fancy bells and whistles, so we're just going to go what we got. So when you think about Lagoos and what it can do, you've got Lagoos connects us. It is the medium through which the energy of our being is transmitted. Everybody, here's something I learned when I was doing all this. Did you know the body cannot tell if it is wet? It will, the body can tell you it is hot, it can tell you it is cold, it can tell you there is pressure, but it cannot tell you that it is wet. It, like a fish, don't know that it's wet, neither do we. If you don't really want to subscribe to that, think about getting into a deprivation chamber. When you get into that deprivation chamber, the lights go out, you do not really know where your being stops, period. It may continue on and on and on. Many people that have been in deprivation chambers will tell you they've had these magnificent experiences as the boundaries of their beings begins to expand. This is an important thing to remember when we talk about uniting our hearts and our minds towards a worthy goal. Who's to say if the limitations that we've been taught are worth keeping? I think Lagu, I'm going to tie all that together here real quick. <laughs> Here's something else to consider. Einstein said that all of the information that is transmitted through the roughly 52 trillion cells that compose the human body, he said that they have the same potential energy as 50,000 atomic bombs. So think about that staggering amount of energy within each of the cells of our body as they all work together. If you Now tell me if you understand that we have all of these cells put together. If you begin to split the atoms in these cells, you would have the energy of 50,000 atomic bombs. Now tell me why it is somebody can achieve everything their heart desired, and some of us are sitting here going, well, I just can't. I'm not really sure why. Because we've been taught that we cannot do that. Somebody in our childhood, be it a parent, a school, a government, some figure has said, well, that's your limit right there. That's as far as you get to go. That's as far as I got to go. That's as far as you get to go. So when we talk about lagoons, all of these things kind of come together. Here we have this assembled host of the gods and goddesses that are going to feast in this, in this realm of the ocean giant. We're made largely of water, aren't we? Now we're going to get start connect things. <laughs> in the creation story between o with Odin, Billy, and Vey, gifting humanity with some very important gifts. They find two beings wandering <coughs> endlessly through life. One of the gifts that is given to humanity is goodly hue and color, the fluid which conducts life. All of these thought processes, all of these electrical impulses that help our body work on autopilot. Our brain is working all of the time, 24-7. We're breathing, our heart is pumping. It's being conducted through a medium that is largely water. Electrical impulses travel through all that and keep us moving. Right? Real simple. There's an energy in that that we can tap into. There's an energy we can tap into that allows us to be something much more than what we were told we could be. Even the people protesting these events are convinced, they're absolutely convinced that the limit of what we can be is what they can imagine. The offensive idea that in this nation, in this United States of America, that someone else can tell you, insist that you accept the limitations of what they are 
is something that also true stands in direct opposition to. This is something that all of us assembled here, for whatever reason, from all over the country, are sitting here thinking, you know what, I don't have to live like that, I'm going to do something better. This is all about that. <coughs> they is the name of the holy enclosures that so many of us build to hold our ceremonies, isn't it? So Odin, Billy, and Vey give these gifts to humanity, these things we are already in possession of. You have them right now. They may be latent, but they are very much there. And we go about, we go into the woods, we go into all these places, and we build a sacred enclosure called a Vey. So Vey gave us these gifts. Think for just a second that our bodies, our forms, may be the Vey for these holy gifts that we've been given. And you've got to ask yourself, what is the shape of my Vey? Is it at the culmination of what it could be? Is it where it needs to be in this world? Am I going to be a glass vase so everyone can just appreciate me? Or is it going to be a powerful mile-wide cauldron that you can brew whatever you need to brew in? The mead of inspiration. This is what we're talking about here. When we talk about La Goose, we are considering that our vase, our body, this vase, this holy enclosure, contains the gift of life. Water, if it represents nothing else in this world, represents life. The ability to conduct energy, information throughout our being to achieve something magnificent. <coughs> now, the identification of the importance and how to incorporate Laguz in your life begins in the lay of Hymen. And an understanding of the feasting tradition as found in just about every faith in the world. Now, if we consider our minds and bodies to be the holy enclosures or bay of the gods full of gifts, we owe it to ourselves, and it is a necessity to set a table in our thoughts that the gods might find a feast worthy of enjoying. Think about that for just a second. Because that's what we're really talking about. <coughs> in every faith in the world, I don't care where you look, there's a group of individuals, a group of gods and goddesses that get together. I don't care if it's Christianity and the, and the, and the, and the marriage feast at Cana or the Last Supper or the feasting tradition we find in Beowulf. You find a group of individuals or Eagles feast that represent the various thoughts, emotions, and things that make up who we are, that animate our body, that keep us moving forward, that allow us to deal with the situations that come up in life, that allow us to create the situations in life that we wish to create to succeed. Now, <laughs> Eager's Feast is set, once again, like I said, in this realm of the ocean giant, Lagoos. Okay? Of old the gods made feast together, and drink they sought, ere seated they were, twigs they shook, and blood they tried, rich fear, rich fare in Eager's Hall they found. It is of no small significance that the gods have found the rich fare they have in the realm of the ocean giant. I'm not talking about fish, I it appears that the gods have what amounts to an insatiable appetite. But I don't think it's necessarily a, a need to conquer, but it's more of a strong and continuous desire to get our attention. A path laid out, and yet another example. All these tales of the Lord, these are examples sometimes of what not to do, but also of ideas and attitudes and postures to accept as we navigate this realm. Perhaps there is something which men ought to know, but we do not. This may be a part of that. You'll have to decide for yourself when you get done if some of this is something that we should have known, but we did not. You'll be able to tell about how successful it is, how worthy it is, if you incorporate it into your life and you begin to enjoy that success that you haven't before. This is not something we are just given. Okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if the initiate were to be handed the wisdom as represented by a, a, our pantheon of gods and goddesses, we would find ourselves overwhelmed in short order, given our current understanding of Austria. We would be overwhelmed with the limitless potential of our being. See, we have to, we've got to kind of negotiate or navigate these, these lore, these ideas, to earn or justify our seat at the table. And that's a very important thing to recognize. Because there's one being who has a seat at the table, but cannot 
justify it. For the life of him, he cannot prove he is worthy to sit there. The gods decide that it is that is that it is in with, within the rich realm of the ocean where they will find their greatest fulfillment. But it is also a representation of our minds. So now we have our body as a veil. It is a container that holds all of these holy gifts. And we have this tale that says the gods decide to feast inside that area. Are we setting a table with our thinking process that might be worthy for the gods to come and enjoy that or not? We have to ask ourselves that on a daily basis. Are, do we have a thinking process in our minds that the gods might say, you know, I'm going to feel good here. I'm going to come in here and let all of these wonderful, powerful, positive attributes of who you are fully manifest and become something much more than we can believe. The people protesting this event have no idea what that means. That feast in the ocean hall, the ocean represents a lot of things, but it is also a representation of our minds. Not the brain, but the powerful spiritual aspect of our being, science is just now beginning to understand, and which religion has long taken advantage of. You see, there is one very unique quality of water which I have only briefly mentioned. Water will assume the shape of the container it is put in. And just like the water, which is vital to life, our minds will assume the shape of the container we place it in. Okay? Every single one of us is working with the container given to us by schools, parents, governments, so on and so forth. And there are people right now protesting this event. They are insisting that we accept the container which has the same shape as theirs. These people protesting this event, this is the limit of their development. We have been given a powerful example of what it means to stop our development because those folks have latched on to an idea that would deny us. And in denying us, they have shackled themselves to anchors that will not allow them to move any further forward. They'll screw a lot of stuff up, but they're every bit as tied down as the individual who is shackled to a ball and chain. Even in Henry David Thoreau's great literary work, Walden, we find a fine example of this in the first chapter. Okay? He bemoans the state of living for the modern man, and I see it reflected in the works of revolutionary activists of today. Thoreau points out that it would be better for a man not to inherit his family farm. Okay? That there is no advice to be gained from the old, and he is right, and he is wrong. It is not the inheritance of the farm which is an anchor to the forward momentum of the man, it is a thinking process about which he must operate that farm, which, provide, which stops his development. The limiting ideals he was taught by his parents that this is exactly how it should be done. You need to repeat the same things we do, is what's keeping many of us from moving away from those limiting ideals our parents decided, well, I'm just going to get a 9 to 5, and I'm just going to work a job, and it'll be okay and be average for the remainder of their lives. Every single person in this room has decided, you know what, I'm going to adopt a faith that is outside of the mainstream of the world. I'm going to adopt a faith and change the foundation of my spiritual existence. When you change that, baby, there's a bunch of other stuff that dominoes with it. We are no longer, all of us sitting here are saying, you know what, there's got to be something better involved in this. There's got to be more to this. That faith over there didn't work. I'm going to try this one. Now what? We're here. We're all listening. We're all paying attention. The people protesting this event decided that the development of their spiritual development is going to be centered around denying someone else theirs. What strength is there in that? What hope is there in that? Not much, folks. Not much at all. <laughs> the people in this room have at some point come across the idea that these containers we have been given may not be suitable for the greatness within each of us. Every one of us has felt somewhere along the way there's something more. There's, <clears throat> it, people want to fight. People simply want to fight. They want to have that magnificent struggle. They want to feel the ability to conquest. It beats within our breast as powerfully as any heart in any man's chest. And yet there is no visible opponent, is there? Who are we to lash out at? Who are we to fight? They're setting themselves up. 
But the people that denied us tried to deny us the ability to speak was a nameless, faceless opponent. There was no one to lash out at. There was no one to fight. Anything we said over here would be taken out of context over here. There was no one to physically say, you know what, you're going to stop running my name in the ground. Couldn't do it. <laughs> Where does that leave us? What do we do with all of this powerful energy? we got to turn it inside. But not an angel. <laughs> they have begun to grasp the simple idea that there should be more to life. That maybe we really don't fit in with this nonsense we see in the world around us as the modern world. But comfort is a powerful pacifier. We're comfortable. Why should we change anything? I got TV. I got a. I got food in the refrigerator. There's no struggle. I'm comfortable where I'm at. I'm really going to mess with it. It'll be all right. All of us that are saying it'll be all right, we're losing ground to those people that say you have to be like I did. It's no longer okay to just be all right. <laughs> there are a plethora of entertainment options available to keep us from thinking about it. We are inundated on a daily basis saying, well, you don't need to worry about all that. Think about this over here. Look at this commercial. Get a new mattress. Sleep better tonight. Buy a new pillow. Look at this wonderful TV. This new wonderful movie's coming out. 300's going to be here. And we can live vicariously through the cinematic efforts of Hollywood. Yeah. And we, we're comfortable. Why would we want to risk that? Why would we want to radically change anything else past that spiritual foundation? It's kind of scary. It's scary enough going from Christianity to where we are today. Where do we, why do we want to continue that struggle? That struggle is what makes us great. But we can't always figure out how to run 100 yard sprints through life to develop our hearts, our emotional well-being, our mental conditioning. we got to figure it out. Here, right here, is how we do that. For most people, it requires an enormous amount of discomfort somewhere in our lives to motivate us to change. And nobody's going to change anything about themselves until it causes them enough pain to want to do so. That's just the way it is. No addict is going to quit doing drugs until it just ruins his life. And even then, it may not. He may have to die to get free of it. No alcoholic's going to quit drinking until it causes them enough pain to want to change it. No workaholic is going to stop doing what he's doing, focusing, getting all the positive reinforcement and everything else from his work until his wife says, you know what, I wanted to marry you and not your work, and leaves. And takes the money, too. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Call to the ball. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> just as... Just as Rig once walked the earth imparting the divine blessing which he did, Odin brings the full force of a symbol Asgard to feast within the containers which represent our minds. Interesting. Now we're going to get into how we secure that, that container for our minds. For much of our life we are content to indulge in the passions and moods so prominent in a society dominated by the extremes of youth. If you're not young, you know, we're not really worth anything anymore, are we? But that joyous playground of the immature mind will not bring about the results expected when Odin, Billy, and Faye offered us good sense and a host of other gifts. Now, we'll get into this other race. The giants have always represented the primal and immature forces of nature and life, base and instinctive, ruled by passions and shortcomings. So a challenge is set for this feast that Odin sets up. A goal, if you will, to set a feast for the gods. It is a goal each one of us must undertake. To set within our minds a feast whereby the blessing of the divine might fully be brought to bear on our existence in a manner congruent with our creation. That is, to develop in something far greater than was imagined when we were given the containers to hold our dreams in when we were young you're a child and say, this is your dream. This is what you get to hold your dream in. That's it. They never tell us how to set that aside and build something new. Which aspects of the divine is represented by our thoughts and emotions do we allow to fill the containers which represent the mind of our being? Will you attempt to cram the truly fantastic proportions of your allotment into a beer bottle? Or would you rather that the meat of inspiration be brewed with a cauldron of cosmic proportions? Or will you settle like so many reality TV stars for just an attractive glass vase? 
He bade, and, and the word wielder toil for the giant work, and so revenge on the gods he sought. He bade Sip's mate the kettle bring, therein for ye shall, much ale shall I brew. Okay? At first glance, it would appear to be a resentment at the mind controlling the passions of the heart. No one likes to deny the heart that which it wants, and the powerful being which rules the oceans must cer most certainly represents the emotional state in this tale. This, this feast of Asgard, this assembled, uh, assembled host of these high, very cerebral, high-minded ideals seek to feast in the realm of the ocean. This is the tides, the, the motions of the ocean, the fish, the feast, the wealth. That is a passionate representation of our hearts. And when the mind and the heart unite, something special, very special happens. But first you have to get to a point where you can allow them to do that. So Thor and Tyr take off. <laughs> the gods have not chosen the realm of the ocean to enslave and conquer it, as many men are wont to do. We will conquer our hearts. We will, and even Christianity has founded itself upon the idea of deny yourself. We see all of these Christian men with, we must deny ourselves these physical passions. We must deny ourselves this. The, the idea of deny yourself is is not what they're talking about in Christianity. They've got that completely screwed up. If you look at the Chinese character for God, it literally means no man. It is a divestiture of your ego. It is getting out of the way. They got that from us. The successful and... <coughs> Successes and failures are largely determined by who we allow to sit at our feast. Think about any holiday dinner. How well does it go? You got somebody worthwhile sitting at your table, it's going to be good conversation. If you've got somebody over there talking about how great he is, it's going to be a long supper. That's just all there is to it. <coughs> the successful endeavor of creating this area to feast uh, will yield a fine unit of the heart and the mind to create more than we might ever imagine. Most of the time when I see people profess a profound understanding of what they consider to be esoteric, I see people who wish to use the power of what I'm talking about right here without doing any of the work necessary to secure that call. They're, and their attempt to sidestep this development that we need. So as that is all said, Tyr comes forward and says, he comes forward and demonstrates his knowledge and a willingness to face the fear of his origins. And that's something a lot of us got to deal with. I know, I, you know why I say that? And none of y'all got to do a damn thing I say. But at some point, we're going to have to address these limitations we've been given. I had to address them to get anywhere near what I wanted to be. Tyr says to Thor, there dwells to the east of Elevagar, Hymir the wise at the end of heaven, a kettle my father fierce doth own, a mighty vessel, a mile in depth. So here is Tyr, originated from giant stock, who tells Thor, look, my dad's got a big cauldron, let's go get it. He's got to go home and deal with that family to secure that vessel to build, to brew those dreams in. So you have this grandfather of wisdom, he takes strength and courage with him, and he goes back home to deal with what's going on with his family. All right? Courage, strength, and wisdom set forth to face the great unknown and secure for the future generation and the seat of the assembly a vessel so vast that there is no limit to the dreams and successes it might bring forth. It's the same thing with us. We must use courage, strength, and wisdom to face those limitations we have been given. The gods and goddesses represent our own inner powers and faculties which enable us to realize our own desires. Some of us will need it when the scope of the limitations we must remove becomes evident. I had a lot of work to do. Some people don't. Some people got a lot more. All of us have ventured forth in life using the container we have been given by our parents. The ones they have been given by their parents. When we hear Thoreau complain about the state of being endured by the man who inherits the family farm, what he is missing 
is the state of mind that this person has also inherited. As far back as we may wish to look, people have pointed this out, but not understood the answer to it. And it has been in our law all along. We must deal with the limitations we have been taught, folks. This is but one of the reasons the secret didn't work for the millions of people that watched it. The great suggestion by Christianity that something out there is going to take care of what's in here is a falsehood because it's never happened. We've been told right here how to handle that. Now we know where to get it. Now we know what it looks like. We've got to go home to get it. We know what it looks like. It's magnificent. Let's talk about what we've got to deal with to do it. Hmm. And the first thing that comes to my mind right here is the youth found his granddad that he greatly he loathed. The full 900 heads she had. So this is Tears' grandmother, and she's got 900 heads. And greatly he loathed her. And I want you just to picture in your mind how this kind of works. Have you guys ever passed somebody on the highway? And as you pass them, they, give, they just turn their full face at you and give you that old full face angry look. Here's Tear's grandmother, has 900 heads, and as soon as he walks in, he gets full faced by 900 heads. We're facing the same thing right now. We have 900 different heads of society taking a good look at us, saying, what are you doing here? Well, we've got to get past that. I know who that is. <laughs> Wonderful lady. Wonderful lady. <laughs> Let's pause for just a second. We'll let Melissa come on in. Yeah, yeah. Everybody stare. Everybody look. <laughs> okay. So when, when he comes in, his grandmother, he gets full faced by his grandmother, but his mother comes and offers him a cup. She offers him a cup. So it's this mother, this bright, she's referred to as the bright browed one, this, this divine feminine kind of nurturing the man to become something greater. There's, that's very important too, because it usually is the divine feminine which nurtures the boy to the point where the masculine allows him to become something better. Masculinity is always bestowed upon men by other men, not by women. Women will take care of him, love him, teach him the ways, and a man is going to take him off somewhere and initiate him into the secrets of man. Right? <laughs> this, this thing of where the, the feminine offers the cup, this is a repeated theme in the feasting tradition of the North, and really, truly, in most of the <coughs> feasting religious literature around the world, regardless of time or geography, it is a woman which hands this man a cup. It was Mary which handed Jesus a cup. He says, look, we're out of wine. You know what he says? Woman, it is not my time. <coughs> so there, Thor and Tyr are in, in uh, Tyr's home, and uh, his mother says, here's a cup, have a drink, come on in. Just hospitality as we should. But when his father comes in, he is fully confronted by his progeny who has gone well beyond anything he could achieve. This giant, while he may rule his household, has never gone past anything like Tyr has to represent greater spiritual ideals for the people. Father's been content to work a factory life, to come home and drink a beer, watch the TV. It's the same principle we get to deal with today. And when we go home, we've got to deal with that with our fathers and our mothers. The mere presence of Thor and Tyr in the giant's home is a reminder of his failures in an average life. And when he comes in and slams the door, all of these kettles break except for the big one, except for the great big one that is his cosmic birthright. All of those kettles represent the participation trophies, uh, the honorable mentions, all of those things that, uh, the, of life. The one piece which does not, and that is the birthright of Tyr. Not the one given to him by his parents, 
but the one which is rightfully his when he is brought into the cosmic scheme of things. And each one of us has one as well. We each one of us have something that is a cosmic gift to us to allow us to brew our dreams in. Do you doubt? I don't doubt it for a second. I have no question that that's the case. I don't doubt for a second that there's going to be a lot of people that say, no, nah, you can't have that. Yes, I can. Look, I found this faith. I stumbled in here on my face. No one comes to the church door, to the to the steps of the church because everything's going hunky dory in their life. They show up here because things suck. They show up here because things are going wrong. They show up here because this container I was given, well, it doesn't quite hold what I am. So it breaks. And when that breaks, we have broken hearts and our and our minds are cracked. And we, we end up on all kinds of different things and we don't know where to go and we don't know what to do. So we go to, we look at faith. <laughs> and I'm telling you right now, all of us that found our way into this faith, this is where it's at. <laughs> There's one, one might think that this is the focus of the story. That they would feast and be done with it. They would show hospitality and you get out of here. That's not the case. And it's not the case when we go to Thanksgiving dinner either, is it? Grizzled old giant, the mighty Thor, head out to the water. They're going to have a fishing contest. This man that has never really accomplished anything in his life is going to take, you know, tears strong. But he said, well, let's go fishing. Let's see what we can catch. Now it's all of a sudden it's competition. Surely he ought to be able to do the same thing that these guys can do. Wasn't he the father of one of them? <laughs> a competition, if you will, for the moody braggart to display his prowess and prove to himself and himself alone that he might be capable of something worthwhile. Perhaps even on par with the gods, surely he could, had not his son endured a journey and been accepted as a member of a fine tribe which rules over everything it sees. <coughs> so they go on a fishing trip. And Thor lands a true giant of a creature, which if he had been allowed to kill it, would have changed the rules for everything. But the uninspired mind... And you all will recognize an uninspired mind. They will go to great lengths to sabotage this effort. In some story, Heimer cuts the line. He gets terrified. I can't handle this. I don't know what's going on. It's changed. It's something's going to happen. And cuts the line. An example of the lengths to which an ego-driven being will go to prevent a change in the world which de would demand a growing up an end of the ability to bluff one's way through life by standing on the false comfort of ceremony and self-importance. To cut the line of another man's success before it overshadows your own is perhaps one of the great sins of existence and a denial of the true aspects of our being. In our world, these actions take the form of careful manipulations, protests, and half-hearted oaths from lesser men to prevent these ventures for, into the realm of development for the individual. But Thor's example is essential here. This is the kind of effort we need more of. Men and women who are willing to go the distance, like all of y'all have to come here today, to help other members of the tribe heave to the waste which hampers their development. Men and women who are secure in their relationships with other men, with other women, with their children, with their wives, with their parents. They're, they're secure in those relationships. And they are strong of mind and back to help these other men succeed. <laughs> you see, when we are in possession of a frame of mind that encourages a free give and take, which is not laden with the misbegotten ideals of selfishness, we are setting the table which would be a delight for the God to enjoy. Y'all see that? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're really getting at. We are setting the table. Take a look at the most successful people in the world. The top two richest men in the world, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, both created a framework which has allowed many thousands, if not millions of men and women to enjoy a success that their parents could only dream of. And as I read that, I thought something else too. They created a framework outside the success that their parents enjoyed. And the parents couldn't understand it. You're going to be an internet bot. You're going to be an author. You're going to give talks. You can't do that. I'm going to put a factory on <laughs> Believe me, I've heard. 
This, this, uh, is your success going to be determined by the same selfish parameters one sees from the baby boomers or the political mach machinations of the millennials? I hardly think so. This, this selfishness of its mind is a remnant of Depression era folks who lost everything. It's one of those things that, that really hurt their pride, it hurt their minds, it hurt their hearts. And they resolved to not let that happen again. And it was carried over into their children. This selfishness of it's my anyway, it's it's a remnant of depression of folks who lost everything. Or is your success going to be determined by something which ensures the success of everyone around you? I am telling all of you this because I think every one of you has what it takes to be as successful as you want to be. Not because it's making me rich. Because it, I'm just moving on through the world like y'all are. But I am much happier. And I think all of y'all can too. That's why this is out here. It's a frame of mind which is free of the petty nonsense which we see so much of today. And much of it was learned from men and women who knew, they absolutely knew, that when the time come, they would be forgiven. No matter the damage they had done and the faulty thinking which they had engendered upon their greatest treasure, their children. It is a frame of mind that I'm talking about as one which is inviting those high-minded ideals of modern society. But the one so many enjoy is something that most of us sitting here today are loath to embrace. The comfort, automatic, pilot mode of transportation through life, from cradle to grave, all set out for you, be a cog in someone else's wheel. In all of this, we have taken a step towards securing the vessel necessary to brew a mead worthy of the gods. That unique substance which offers inspiration to so many of us and provides some small connection to the great stories of our past. If we have faced the fear such as tear and secured, and secured a powerful positive friendship based on the goodwill of all we have, we have taken a powerful first step towards identifying the vessel we may need to brew the dreams and desires of our life and share them with all of those who are close to us. <coughs> not to obligate them to us, not to enslave them to our mindset, but to encourage them that it can be done on their behalf as well. To feast and drink in the autumn during the harvest speaks volumes of what we might expect if we grab onto these simple concepts and put them to use in our life. <coughs> and we are well underway in our efforts to set a table for a divine feast in our own thinking. Excuse me. And we are doing so in the realm of the sea giant, surrounded by water, La Goose. All of this is taking place in that powerful energy of La Goose, water. <coughs> One of the comments which inspired me to put all that together was a comment by Napoleon Hill when he said of a friend of his, he said, well, I don't believe the man would tolerate a negative thought. And I thought, God, that's powerful. To have a, a, a presence of your own thinking that you would not tolerate a negative thought. Think about that for just a second. I can't tell you how many times I get up and I, I'm fixing to go climb a tower and I'm tired, I'm still a little sore from the day before and there's a, it's going to be hot and the next thing you know, I'm mad at some joker driving down the highway. And I'm using that anger as fuel because my body is physically tired and my mind is tired and I get angry about something and now I'm moving forward just using that fuel as anger. Using that anger as fuel. we got to stop that. All of this is about stopping that. Because every time we fall back on that old trained, learned behavior, we stop moving forward as people, as individuals, as powerful spiritual beings. <coughs> this, this idea of not tolerating a negative thought is very important. That's what we're going to endeavor to accomplish today, using our Lord to do it. But just as Tyr and Thor had to struggle greatly in more than one aspect of their being, we will have to do some groundwork to create a mindset where such ideals might flourish in our lives. When we get to Eager's Feast, and that's where we're at right now, the guests praise much of the, much the ability of Eager's serving men. 
these men are busting their butt. And the guests are like, thank you so much. You guys are doing a great job. I appreciate that. These powerful, positive aspects of spirituality are praising these lowly servants. They're saying, we appreciate you for doing the hard work you're doing. Thank you so much. It's not beneath them to say thank you. The guest, but there's one that got offended by it. Loki might not endure that. And he slew Femifang. The gods shook their shields and howled at him and drove him away to the forest. All of the effort required of two gods to support and encourage the development of others to enjoy the company of heroes is destroyed in just a minute by a being who could not or would not live up to that standard. And instead of even trying, I can't do that, Well, Now he can't do that either. Let's see what you got. These two just deal, had to deal with a month of it. They can't do it. And they're going to try to cut their throats. That's just the way it goes. And it's not the way we're supposed to be in heathenry. For just one thought, one being, one dinner guest who is possessed of the selfishness to the extent that he cannot abide anyone achieving that which he cannot do of his own or be given will ruin all of our efforts. Sound familiar? It is the same thing in our thinking process, people. One bad thought leads to another. And you will see people who are so thoroughly entrenched in their negative thinking that they will go out of their way to share it with you. Misery loves company. Hmm. More importantly, they will go to astounding lengths to see that you feel the same way. They will run their mouths about you on Facebook. They will protest your events and business endeavors. They will call you names. They will leave bad reviews. They will do their best to ensure that you do not land that giant of a beast and kill it. They will stop you from slaying the dragon in your own life because they can't do it. This is the power of positive thinking is stepping away from that. And it's thousands of years old. <coughs> if you succumb to these mind games, if you allow their thinking to influence yours or control your thought and action, growth stops at that point. Right then. Right there. The ego assumes full control. Next thing you know, we're a victim. Now what are we going to do? We repeat, and it's trained. We learned how to do that. We watch it on system. You can't walk down the street without being a victim. And we see it told to us every night on national TV, on the local news. This person was walking down the street and somebody said something ugly to him and he had to break down and cry. <laughs> and there's no limit to the point. There's no limit to the principles we will be asked to sacrifice to be accepted as the person that is willing to cry. We repeat negative thoughts to ourselves a hundred times a day. I may not have done so good in that. I might use some anger to feel I'm tired. Well, that's so and so, blah, blah, and use it. We repeat negative thoughts to ourselves a hundred times a day. Some situation, some idea, some failure. And each time we relive those moments, our bodies will react as if it's happening. Our bodies do not know that what our minds are thinking is not occurring. It will release a flood of chemicals necessary to help the being survive that engagement. The continued influx of those kind of chemicals into our body, guess what that creates? Sickness, disease, anxiety. There's Chelsea. Some see, let's see here. Now, does every under that's that's Chelsea. She wrote a poem, I'm sure. Does everyone understand? I'm going to wait till she gets here to do this last one. This is kind of important. I only got one more slide, two more slides to go. And we'll take a little break. No break. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you weren't out there fishing, baby. <laughs> Hi, Chelsea. Thank you for coming. I made it. No, I'm proud of you. <coughs> so let's go back to that start where that was again. When we repeat these negative thoughts to ourselves a hundred times a day, some situation, some idea, some failure, and each time we relive those moments, our bodies will react as if we are still in that situation. Now, if we, does everyone understand the idea of the well in our ceremony and faith? 
what the well represents when we go through, we pass the horn, and we place these thoughts, these ideas, these powerful aspects of ourselves into the well. Um, the acts of our life, our deeds, deeds not words, is very important. Each one of our deeds fills the well at the root of our being, at the well of at the well of the norns, at the bottom of Rigdasil, fills it with fresh, clean water. We are doing right action every day. We fill that refreshing well with fresh, clean water. If we screw up and screw somebody over, we do something bad, we do something we know we shouldn't do, you get a drop of ink in that well, don't you? So now we're trying to nourish the roots of our being with contaminated water. That becomes a very ugly cycle. You can't get rid of that ink. It's going to be in the well, period. Wasting time thinking about it is not going to change the fact that it's there. But your actions and your deeds can help dilute that. And that's what we're looking for here. Not forgiveness, not salvation. Let's just clean up the water a little bit. Let's nourish the roots of our life with fresh, clean, once again, water. La goose. <laughs> if we step outside the noble path of life, we might imagine that we are dropping that little drink of ink into the well, and the water the norns used to re refresh Yggdrasil as well as the foundation of our life are contaminated. Okay? Just went over all that. <laughs> when we take a look at the assembled host in the well of the ocean giant, actually surrounded by the energies of Laguz and the interconnectedness of all things, we see that one bad idea who has demanded the seat of the table after he has already screwed it up, he has weaseled his way back into the process by playing on the idea that these people owe him something. We do the same thing with our own thing. How many times do you remember some situation and it serves to feed your body those chemicals as if the event were still happening? We're using it. See, but the gods don't owe this fellow anything. And no one owes us anything. If we secure this thinking process in our minds, we won't need to feel like someone ought to do better by us. We will begin to understand that the gods have been quite liberal with the gifts we have been given already. Don't let someone else's label of you hinder who you are. In the book Eager's Feast, I go through each encounter as every other aspect of the divine takes a turn defending the other one. <coughs> and each time, we get the same types of responses we get from the people that tried to prevent this from happening. In each instance, we get a perspective of someone who has been given a seat at the table but stopped right there. Their understanding of the interaction of the divine is limited by their perception of their own mortal reality. It, <laughs> the rest of his actions and the thinking they engage in are an example of a being who does not understand how the divine interacts with each other. Each god or goddess, they defend each other only to have their actions scrutinized by someone who hasn't got a clue, and then they back away. We lose that powerful positive aspect. It vanishes. It. We, we, we've already contaminated it. They excuse themselves from the feast of our own mindset because we let someone, some idea, or some memory in, which is poisonous, and we didn't stop it. It's our mind. We control it. It's time to take control of it. If we look at them as just people, we see one thing. If we look at them as gods and goddesses, as forces of nature, we see a natural order of things. And if we perceive them as the assembled host, representations of all the emotions, ideas, strengths, and virtues of who we are, willing to feast in the location we have set, a feasting table within our own mind suitable for the gods, why would we allow for even a second those negative, ego-boosting thoughts to disrupt what we have worked so hard to put together? And yet we do it. Every time we punish ourselves by wasting any time thinking about those things that have caused us pain. You were taught to do that. You watched your parents do it. The illiterate people of today, of the future, are not the folks who cannot read or write. They're the folks who cannot learn, unlearn, and learn these new things. And we are on the cutting edge of that. We are on the cusp of greatness itself. Here we are. We have unlearned one faith to embrace a new one. Now let's finish the process of rebuilding our hearts and minds and show the world why this ancient faith could not be eradicated. 
This does not mean we sacrifice principles to make the blind comfortable in the darkness. It means we stand our ground, we take control of the most powerful tool of the universe, our own minds. Couldn't be more simple than that, people. This path that each of us have set out upon really is a path to explore that curious feeling of something important which resides in our hearts. Some calling, something that resonated within us to say, I'm going to keep walking this path and see what happens. That calling which urges you on to something bigger and better. I know for myself I have felt it many times in my life. And yet I felt as if I had no clue whatsoever where to start or where even I might need to look to get there. So I urge you, finish shattering those clay pots you've been given as children. Finish shattering those pots that begun that you begun when you became something different spiritually. Find that foundation inside you and reinforce with the power of belief in yourself and cement into your minds the idea of what it is you wish to do, be, or see in this world. And do not for one instant <laughs> give the time of day to any person who wants to spend their time telling you that you can't do that. Your awakening is in full swing, folks. We are here. We put forth the effort. It's happening. There's no changing that now. Don't go back to sleep. Don't trade one set of limiting ideals for another. No matter how progressive someone might say they are. We only get one shot at this in this life, so far as we know. That's it. One shot at this room. Don't waste another second letting other people penetrate the cell wall of your dreams to drain it of the precious water which connects you to it. There isn't anything in this in this room that wasn't a thought in someone else's <coughs> mind before it became a reality, including you. It was a thought in a person's mind who just knew they could do it, and they went and did it. Now that you know the same thing, it is time to set aside the limitations imposed upon you and embrace the freedom of a thinking process inspired and empowered by the gods. The tale of exactly how to do this as it's right here in front of us since before the dawn of civilization. In closing, allow me to read this from Thoreau's classic Walden, because I think it sums this all up beautifully. We might try our lives by a thousand simple tests, as for instance, that the same sun which ripens my beans illumines at once a system of earth like ours. If I had remembered this, it would prevent, have prevented some mistakes. And this was not the light in which I hold them. The stars are the apexes of wonderful triangles. What distant and different beings in the various mansions of the universe are contemplating the same one at the same moment? Nature and human life are as various as our several constitutions. Who shall, who shall say what prospect life offers to another? Could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? We should live all the ages of the world in an hour, I, and all the worlds of the ages, history, poetry, mythology. I know of no reading of another's experience, so startling as, and as informing as this would be. I thank every one of you for your time and your effort today. Thank you. underneath them trees. So let's slide over into the trees and catch our breath, folks, huh? And uh